Hi guys! So in my last video, I taped two piezo discs together. I put them in this apparatus that I made. I played sound out of one considered as a speaker and into the other one considered as a microphone. And I plotted the results. And I said that that plot represents the combined frequency response of the two piezo discs with certain caveats. And today, I want to discuss exactly what those caveats are. And so the big, huge headline caveat is that the frequency response of a contact microphone or a piezo disc is not constant. In fact, it's not even really a sensible question, what is the frequency response of a contact mic? Because to use a contact mic, you have to attach it to something. And the act of attaching it to something changes its frequency response. So consider that instead of taping two microphones to one another, imagine that I instead taped them to a table and play sound through them this way. Well, two things happen. One is, of course, that that sound is transformed also by the table because the sound is now traveling through the table, and that's fine. But the other thing is that the act of attaching the discs to the table has changed the frequency response of the disc because now the discs are bound down more firmly than they were when they were just taped to each other. Okay, it's just like any other vibrating object or any other musical instrument. If you dampen it, it sounds different. And the exact same thing is true for these piezo discs or any other type of contact mic. The frequency response is going to depend on exactly how it's damped. And I can demonstrate this very easily. So to start with, I'm going to repeat the same experiment that I did last time. I have these piezo discs. I play white noise through them, and then I plot the result, and this is the result. It looks pretty much the same as last time. Nothing new here. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this huge blob of white poster putty and stick it to the back of one of these discs. I guess I'll stick it to the back of the microphone disc. Notice that the sound is not traveling through the putty because the discs are still taped together back to back. So I'm not measuring the sound transmission properties of this putty. I'm just attaching mass to the back of the disc. So it dampens the disc and changes the way that it vibrates. So now I repeat my experiment. And this is the result. And Again, the big headline here is that these plots are not the same. The frequency response of the discs changed just by virtue of the fact that I added mass to one of them. Okay, the other interesting thing is that attaching mass to one of the discs seems to have kind of smoothed out the frequency response. So these peaks and valleys are no longer as large as they are without the putty. And that's actually good because what you want is a microphone with a flat frequency response. And I suspect, although I don't have any way of measuring it, that if you really attach a piezo disc very firmly to a massive object, like a door or something, that the frequency response becomes pretty flat. So that's good. But still, the main takeaway here is that if I talk about the frequency response of a microphone, that frequency response is really only valid for a particular setup or a particular way of attaching the mic to a particular thing. And if you start talking about a different setup, then the frequency response will probably change. Okay, so the other thing that I said last time is that this graph actually represents two times the frequency response of one of the disks. And I want to elaborate on the theory behind that statement a little bit more, because once we understand the theory, then we should be able to do another experiment that really clearly demonstrates just how futile it is to talk about the frequency response of a contact microphone. So here's the theory. These are my two piezo discs taped together. 
and if I send an electrical impulse down the lead wires of the speaker, then the speaker will vibrate in some way, and I will call that vibration A. You can think of A as being the displacement of the speaker over time, T, when it's been exposed to this electrical impulse. So A is the impulse response of the speaker. And similarly, if I mechanically stimulate the microphone with an impulse, then it will send some electrical signal down its lead wires, and I will refer to that signal as B. So B is the impulse response of the microphone. And the first question that I'd like to know the answer to is if I send an arbitrary sound, X, into the speaker, then what sound Y is going to come out of the microphone? And the answer is that when I send X into the speaker, what the speaker actually plays out is the convolution of X and A. And if you don't know what convolution is, it's not that important. Just know that the speaker has this weird way of smearing together its input X with its impulse response A. Anyway, so then, because the speaker and microphone are taped together, that whole thing is going to get picked up by the microphone. And then again, what actually comes out of the microphone is the convolution of that whole thing by its impulse response B. And because this whole expression now is what came out of the microphone, then that's equal to Y. And so this just says that what I get out of the microphone is equal to what I put into the speaker convolved with the impulse response of the speaker and the impulse response of the microphone. And that's all fine and dandy if you're working in the time domain, but I'm actually not interested in the time varying impulse responses A and B. What I really want to know is the frequency response of the speaker and microphone. And so what I need to do is take the Fourier transform of each term in this equation. And the Fourier transform has two properties of interest right now. The first is that the Fourier transform transforms an impulse response into a frequency response. And so here I'm using the uppercase letter A to indicate that that's the Fourier transform of A. And that's now a function of frequency F, not time T. The other important property of the Fourier transform, in fact, probably the most important property of the Fourier transform, is that it converts convolution into regular multiplication. So if I go back here to my equation down there, and I apply the Fourier transform separately to each term in the equation, then I end up with this, which says that the spectrum of sound that comes out of the microphone is equal to the spectrum of the sound that I put into the speaker times the frequency response of the speaker times the frequency response of the microphone. And so this too is all fine and dandy if you're working directly with the kind of raw Fourier coefficients, which you could think of them as being in volts or something like that. But in my case, I just think that my plots look nicer if I plot them in decibels instead of volts. And to convert volts to decibels involves a logarithm. And logarithms have this special property that they convert multiplication into addition. So again, if I go back to my equation there at the bottom and convert each term to decibels, then I can just add the terms instead of multiplying them. Okay, the other thing that can be said about this equation is that in my case, the signal that I'm putting into the speaker, X, is white noise. And white noise has the special property that it's just constant. It's the same across all frequencies. And so this first term just has the effect of raising or lowering the whole plot or shifting the whole plot kind of up or down on the y-axis. But the fact is that I don't really care about the position of the plot on the y-axis. All I care about is its shape. In fact, this whole equation 
already doesn't have a well-defined position on the y-axis because I never told you what I consider to be zero decibels in the first place. And anyway, I can shift the whole plot up and down just by adjusting the volume on my mixer. So this first term doesn't really have any meaningful effect on the equation, so I might as well just get rid of it. And so I just have to bear in mind, and this is another one of those caveats, that this equation is only true up to some constant. And the location of zero decibels is kind of arbitrary, and if I want to compare two plots, then I need to be very careful not to adjust the volume in between. But with that caveat in mind, the big takeaway here is that the output of the microphone is just the frequency response of the speaker plus the frequency response of the microphone. Okay, so that's kind of the big result that I needed here. And the lemma is that if I have two identical piezo disks, then A equals B, and therefore what I get out of this speaker is either twice A or equivalently twice B, which is what I originally said. But the more general result kind of says that I should be able to take any two disks, not necessarily identical ones, and tape them together, and what I should get back is the sum of their frequency responses. Okay, so why don't we put that to the test? So I'm gonna start out here by repeating the exact same experiment that I've repeated several times already. I have these two piezo disks, I put them in my apparatus, I press my sample button, and this is the result that comes back, same as you've seen a few times already. The only difference this time is that I've divided the result by two. So in principle now, this is just the frequency response of one of those disks. Okay, so let me take this out of here. Now, I also have some other larger piezo disks over here. In fact, let me refer to these larger disks as disks B, and the original smaller ones I'll call disks A. And so now I'm gonna tape together two disk Bs back to back, and I'll put those in my apparatus. And again, I'll run my experiment, play noise into one out of the other one, and here you go, this is the result of that. And again, I've divided the result by two, so in principle, this is the frequency response of just one disk B. And it's interesting to note just how different disk B is from disk A. So here they are together. Okay, so anyway, that's fine. So let me take this out of here, and now what am I gonna do? Well, I'm going to pry apart these disks, which I taped together so diligently. And now I'm going to stick one disk A to one disk B. And when I put this in my apparatus, I should get the frequency response of A plus the frequency response of B. And I already know what the frequency response of A is because I just measured it. And I already know what the frequency response of B is because I just measured it. So now I can check if this works. Okay, so I'm gonna put this whole thing in my apparatus, and I guess it doesn't really matter which way I do this, but for the sake of consistency, I'll use disk A as the speaker and disk B as the microphone. And again, run my experiment. And this is the result, and this one I haven't divided by two. So this really should be A plus B. So there's A and there's B, and this new plot should be A plus B. So stop and look at this for a moment and try to convince yourself whether or not this looks like A plus B to you. So to make this a little clearer, I'm going to try to recover A. So in other words, I'm gonna take this A plus B and subtract out B, and that should give me A. Okay, so here is that, the recovered A. And this was the original A that I was trying to recover. And these don't look anything like one another, nor does this look anything like B. And the point here is that A does not equal A, or B did not equal B, or both. In fact, it's not even really possible to tell. So what does this show? It shows that the math is broken? 
Well, no, in fact, the math is correct. This result is correct. It's true that A does not equal A. The frequency response of the disks changed. Okay, the small disk vibrates differently when it's taped to another small disk as opposed to when it's taped to a large disk. And similarly for the large disk, when it's taped to another large disk, its edges are bound, and when it's taped to a small disk, its edges are free. So of course it has a different frequency response. And so this really clearly highlights the point that it's not even really sensible to talk about the frequency response of a piezo disc or of a contact microphone more generally, because it's not constant and it depends on what you put the mic on. Okay, I guess that's the end of my rant today. So, uh, as usual, subscribe, like, share on social media, etc., etc., etc. You know the drill, all that stuff really does help me and I appreciate it when you do it. So yeah, I guess that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye!